Welcome to the Form.Life podcast. In today's episode, we have a conversation with Jay Stringer about the unwanted sexual desires and behaviors that we all face in our lives. My name is Paul, and I serve as the campus pastor at our Shawnee campus. And I'm Bill, and I serve as the campus pastor at Christ Community's Brookside Campus and co-host on this podcast where we are all about deepening our formation in Jesus for all of life. Yeah, that's exactly right, Bill. And today, in that mission, we get to hear from Jay, who is a licensed mental health counselor, ordained minister, and author of the book, Unwanted, How Sexual Brokenness Reveals Our Way to Healing. While a good portion of this conversation discusses sexual brokenness, Jay actually takes the conversation so much further, too. Yeah, we get to hear Jay paint a compelling vision that will move someone forward in meaningful ways towards sexual wholeness, and that's something we all want. Absolutely, yeah. And Jay's insights I just found to be particularly helpful. You know, another fascinating aspect of my time in conversation with him is how the broad framework that Jay uses in this book to apply to sexual brokenness is actually really adaptable to issues beyond that. So we're excited for you to hear everything that Jay has to offer. So let's jump right into my conversation with him. Jay, thanks so much uh, for being here with us today. Uh, your wisdom on this topic, and again, uh, we've kind of set off the air, not just on this topic, but the book and, and how it even applies uh, so much more broadly beyond sexual brokenness. But it's been really helpful uh, to us. Uh, we've we've learned a lot from it, and we're excited to have a conversation and share those insights today. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Honored to be here. Excited for our conversation. Yeah, and to start, I'm, I wonder if you could could just give a little bit of the overview of the book. So the title is Unwanted, uh, subtitled uh, How Sexual Brokenness Reveals Our Way to Healing, uh, and would love to hear both just, yeah, a little bit of an elevator explanation, overview, kind of the big idea, uh, but then also I'm really fascinated by how this book came to be. So what led you to the creation of it, sort of what was the process uh, to, to get to a place where uh, you've kind of had this uh, had this done and it can bless so many people? So I wonder if we can start there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the big idea of unwanted is that our unwanted sexual behavior, which could be defined as the use of pornography, extramarital affairs, buying sex, just a fantasy that you have been uh, trying to outgrow for a long time. Uh, my research and my clinical sense is that those those behaviors are not random. Uh, they are a direct reflection mm. of the parts of our story that remain unaddressed. And so the big implication here is that uh, sexual brokenness can be a roadmap to healing rather than this life sentence to shame or addiction or whatever we have been told. And so that's the big idea is let's let's bring the problems, the heartache, the brokenness, the sin into the foreground, and let's get really curious about the origins of how that all began. And then with curiosity and kindness, uh, that's how we're going to be able to heal and grow. So those are the big ideas. Uh, why did I do that? Well, I mean, for a lot of reasons. Uh, I have personal stories, I have theological stories, church stories, but uh, a couple initial ones that come to mind are, uh, you know, uh, there are certain books that have been written, uh, and I don't have to name them all by name, but they are largely what I would refer to as lust management. And lust mm -hmm. management is you bounce your eyes from attractive people if you're having a, a sexual thought. You get internet monitoring on your computer. Uh, one of the leading books actually says, like, specifically to women, when your husband is trying to stop using porn, you need to present your body as a merciful vial of methadone to him. So, mm. I mean, lust management is behavioral management, but it's also very harmful to marriages, to people that are trying to outgrow mm. this stuff. So that would be kind of more of the Christian framework that often, unfortunately, gets uh, applied to sexual brokenness is let's just try and manage it. Let's try and control it with accountability, internet monitoring, uh, willpower. Or you have a cultural narrative that would just say, you know, shame is the primary issue that we're dealing with. Yeah. And so if we can just reduce shame and stigma, then people are going to eventually get healthy. And so we have shame management and lust management. 
But neither of those approaches really invite us to get really curious about why are we doing the things that we are are doing. So that kind of led to the decision to do research of like, you know, there's so many studies that have been done that would say a third of all porn users are now women. We know that infidelity mm. will affect about a third of all marriages. We know that porn sites at one point received more interest and more site visits than Twitter, Netflix, Facebook combined, right? Oh my gosh, so we know yeah. that it's wow. really big issues, but we don't necessarily know like why are people drawn to those themes to begin yeah. with. And so uh, the research that I did looked at people's family of origin, their mother relationship with their mother and father, the adverse childhood experiences that have been through like bullying to abuse to trauma. Uh, and then what were people dealing with in the present, like a lack of purpose, depression, anxiety. And then, uh, you know, we also looked at what did you fantasize about? Like when you went to a porn site, what did you put into Google or what was your primary fantasy? Yeah. Yeah. And so very, very holistic survey that we did and then put all that together in the analytics. And that's essentially what we found is that, you know, all of these things, the fantasies, the present purposelessness, the the past wounds that we have not addressed are all part of our sexual brokenness today. And that's the real hope of this book is, can we begin to get curious about our sexual brokenness so that it begins to open up the wider stories of healing that God is very committed to as well? Yeah. And he is, isn't he? So committed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, 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 and you've already said how those wider stories, uh, the particular, uh, the particularities of each person's sexual brokenness can even uh, quite possibly and does, and you've seen this in your practice, uh, provide a roadmap uh, for a way a way forward. And so uh, mm -hmm. I, I was struck by that as I read through the book. Um, and again, both thinking back through my own story, it certainly prompted that uh, as well. But, but sort of this third way between uh, just lust management, between more of a cultural approach uh, to shame management, to, to this... Uh, I love the word curiosity, um, mm -hmm. this idea of even you use the phrase in the book, listening to our lust. And uh, on a, I think on a different podcast, I heard you uh, really talk out uh, this metaphor of the house and the front porch. Mm -hmm. And uh, does that strike a bell? Does that, can you, can does, you maybe yeah. explain a little bit of that metaphor? Yeah, explain a little bit of that metaphor uh, for our listeners and then some of the advantages you've seen, and I think you've already hit on some of these, uh, within that third approach to listening to our lust, being curious, uh, with a bent towards kindness. Uh, and yeah, I wonder if you could, could unpack Love some it. of that a little bit. For sure. Yeah. So part of where I would begin is like Romans 12, 2, which says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, and the sad reality for most of us as Christians is that we cannot renew our sexual mind if we don't have any idea what is actually inside of it. And so what we're trying to mm. do in this approach is to kind of say like, you know, discipleship includes not just our sanctification, our relationships, but also our sexual story. And so yes. how can we, you know, submit our sexual story and be really curious about what our sexual story is so that we can begin this process of renewing our sexual mind. So that metaphor that we use of uh, seeing your sexual life as a house is, you know, I, I just kind of present it in this online course that we have called The Journey. And it basically looks at... Um, you know, I want you to imagine that it's late in the evening and you feel that familiar kind of knock of lust come to your door and just pose the question, like, what are you going to do in those moments? Well, in the past, you may have tried to put like internet monitoring around your home to kind of keep yeah, uh, porn right. sites out, to just kind of keep all intruders at bay. Maybe you call a friend for backup and say, I'm just like really struggling tonight. Uh, or you just let the intruder kind of ransack various rooms of your house. So it's either mm. like a stiff arm approach or just like I'm tired and exhausted from trying to fight this thing forever. It's just easier if I just let it in. But mm. the third way I think would be, yeah, what if you went out onto the front porch of your sexual life? 
And you began to kind of ask questions to your lust, to your fantasy. And you just kind of said, like, I wonder why this particular porn search has been appealing to me since I was 13 years of age. Or I wonder why when I'm experiencing a lot of anger and there's a lot of contempt in my marriage, I feel much more likely to pursue an unwanted behavior or an affair partner becomes appealing or porn Mm. becomes more appealing when I'm really angry. Why is that? And so again, just this approach of being able to uh, extend a level of kindness and curiosity to the sexual fantasies that you have. And I think what you'll find is that those, those behaviors, those fantasies all provide clues. So one example Mm. of this from the research was, you know, we looked at, you know, if you were a man who tended to look for porn that dealt with like younger women, maybe a race that suggested to you some level of subservience. Uh, This was kind of coded as a type of power over others and not necessarily degrading or cruel power over others, but there was definitely a sense of like someone was lesser than you in the fantasy and you could use them for your own sexual gain. What we learned about that particular porn search and fantasy was that these men tended to have three key drivers in their backstory. The first was uh, a very strict father. Uh, Second was a high level of lack of purpose in their life. And then the third was lots of shame. So if you were to just play like armchair psychologist for just a moment, you know, lust or porn is not just about lust. It's also about this element of power. So if you grew up in a fairly authoritarian home where a father or a mother kind of ruled over you, kind of uh, were highly critical, gave you looks that kind of were intended to shame, just a lot of control and rigidity, porn might be the first experience in your life where you feel like you have some level of power to choose and to get what you want. Uh, Same thing with a lack of purpose in life is that we found specifically for men that when men had a lack of purpose in life, they were seven times more likely to pursue the use of pornography than those who had high purpose scores. So again, just that sense of like, if you have an unaddressed story with your parent, uh, where they were pretty cruel and demanding, or you're dealing with a lot of lack of purpose in your present day life that is going to influence your sexual behavior to be able to find a realm in life like porn where you cannot fail. You can get exactly what you want when you want it. And so that's really what we're trying to deconstruct here is, you know, the fantasies and the behaviors aren't random. They're connected to these other stories. So, yeah. And that's the key advantage then to this third way is the other two ways you never get at the root of all that. You never, uh, you never sort of uh, the the clues never bubble to the surface, um, and so then Precise. it's it's it, it's just sort of this uh, yeah kind of a re- repetitive. Uh, you just start going back to the well over and over and over again. Where this uh, idea of going out to the front porch, not letting it into the house, but saying, "Hey, why are you here?" and uh, mm-hmm. trying to to wrestle a little more thoughtfully and creatively and curiously. But I wonder um, when you kind of mentioned <clears throat> even in that example. Uh, of of a man who might search for a particular form of pornography, sort of the prevalence of of shame. Um, I know too, as we think, uh, and there's been some really good books written about this, but uh, and this is a broad category of kind of purity culture, um, which you know I grew up uh, in a in a wonderful church in the '90s that probably had a, a bit of that, uh, and I know that there were well meaning and well intended sort of leaders and ideas in the midst of that, but that. We have seen, I think, this link between uh, a really intense version of that and uh, a lot of shame. Uh, and mm-hmm. and so I, I see that, but then I also go, okay, well, and, and you do this, I think, really uh, nu- in a nuanced way in the book. I have this question of what is, what's a helpful way for us to still integrate the reality of sin into this conversation? Um, because again, I think in sort of broad bro, broad brush purity culture, that was really the like, you know, really they were taking sin so seriously, which of course we want to do. Um, so how do we still do that? And how do we more helpfully and not harmfully integrate sin into this conversation? I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Sure. 
Yeah. Uh, so a couple of different things. So like when we're, when we're thinking about purity culture primarily, um, I mean, it wasn't just against uh, sin. It was against even having any hint of desire in many cases. Mm-hmm. So it was a very harmful, you know, storyline that was told to men that on one hand, you know, boys, this is going to be the battle that you have for the rest of your life. This is going to be the thorn in your flesh. Uh, and you're just going to have to kind of militantly work to kill this thing. Uh, but again, like no sex education for the most part with regard to what was all happening. And so one example of this would be, you know, when you are a 13 year old boy, you have something like a, a shot glass of testosterone in your system. By the time you reach the age of 15, you have like a pint glass of testosterone. So <laughs> hormones are going to go wild at that point. Desire, yeah. sexual yeah. interest, yeah. Uh, things yeah. that you're interested in, like that desire to kind of go out into the world and explore are going to be full on, just quite, they're going to be madness at that point. So if you have not not discipled and trained and equipped people Mm. to understand their body. And then you're going to call that increased sexual interest sin. Uh, That's Mm. malpractice because you have not trained people to work with the bodies that God has given to them. Uh, Same thing with a lot of women that I've worked with clinically where you know, their parents maybe took them out of the sex ed class because they didn't trust the public school, but then failed to provide any education whatsoever so that when they had their period for the first time, they thought that they Mm -hmm. were dying because no one had equipped them. And so that's really what we're running into is just, you know, Brené Brown says that for shame to develop, we need secrecy, silence, and judgment. And Mm -hmm. on that read, the church can often become a very significant place for sexual shame to develop because there's no language, a lot of silence, a lot of judgment there. And so that's really what I want to push back against is, you know, you know, this sense of, you don't, uh, I think I use this in the book as well, but some level of, you don't teach people how to cook by just telling them about salmonella. And yet that's been the primary place that the church is like, you know, sex is really good, but don't get salmonella. But we don't teach people how to cook and how to work with the bodies and desires that God has given to us. So all of that to say, we can't fail to educate and then also try to trap and convict people of sin. I think that that's that's very, very... That's very sinful behavior right there. (laughs) Um, But with regard to sin, you know, part of what Jesus is describing, particularly in Matthew 5, is this issue of really lust and anger. So the the word that Jesus uses is epithumeo, which essentially means to covet. And so it's not just sexual in nature that you know, that you're having an affair. It's like, I can, I can covet, I can lust to become married. I can lust to get rid of my marriage because marriage is really hard. I can lust to have kids. I can lust to just get rid of my kids. So lust is not just what we're doing with our genitals. Lust is (laughs) this sense of covetousness in life. And so then when it comes to, you know, the issue of Matthew 5 with regard to murder, it's that, you know, you can hate someone and you struggle with them and you you want to kill them. That's what James 4 kind of talks about. It's like, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Well, you want something, but you don't get it. And so therefore you kill. And that's where Mm. I would say like, yes, there's something about porn and using someone else for sexual gain. That's the epithumeo. Like I'm coveting this person, this context, and I'm going to use them for my own gain. It's not about covenant. It's not about like I am committing my life legally, emotionally, spiritually to this person. I'm just going to use you. Well, that's sin. But also it's not just an issue of lust. It's also an issue of anger. And I think that would speak to a lot of marriages where you know, I want my husband to be far more emotionally engaging than he is. But somehow something about golf or his work world is so much more important. And then that becomes something of the context of an affair. Or for a Mm -hmm. lot of men, I just, I want, I lust for my wife to want me more sexually. But then when she doesn't, 
I'm going to kind of go behind her back and make her pay for not being sexual enough through using porn and all fine. And that's, that's really the anger piece. And so I think that's where we need to have, you know, just integrity yeah. with regard to our sin is like, yes, to lust and fantasy uh, and sexual behavior outside of marriage, but also can we step into there's other forces at work with regard to sin and anger is often one of those unaddressed realities that most people don't connect to their sexual life. Yeah, that's, I completely agree. Um, and I really appreciate where you started, uh, in the answer to, uh, to kind of amend my question or to add, uh, a reminder in about the desperate need, uh, for a more positive and holistic, uh, discipleship, uh, discipleship pathways and methods, particularly maybe, uh, for our young people, though not exclusively, right? I think we could say all of us need that. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I wonder if I could even take you back to that part of your answer and ask you uh, who you have seen and you can name them or not, but what leaders, what churches have you seen that are doing that really well, um, that sort of have recognized like, oh, we do, we need, we can't, we can't say, Cooking's great. Let me tell you about it. Don't get food poisoning. I love that. You yeah. did use that metaphor in the book. So yeah. how, who, who's doing that really well? What have you, who have you really admired in terms of leaders and churches that you're like, yeah, they, they kind of get the holistic sense of this and they want to, they want to move towards something, something different. Does that question make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yep. Um, so uh, part of what I would say, and this might be discouraging is uh, I have to go outside of the church for the most part to hear that, mm. uh, to get the education. So I have learned from a lot of people that are not Christians with regard to this. Uh, so when it comes to things like, uh, you know, I was listening to one sex educator where she was talking about, like, you need to become your child's Google. And so a lot of Christian parents are like, oh, I don't want to talk to my child too early or ruin their mm -hmm. innocence. But the reality is, is like if the average age of initial exposure is nine to 11 with porn, the parent has the choice to either say, I'm going to be the primary sex educator of the child or porn or my middle school peers. And so uh, a lot of the sex educators that would push back against a lot of uh, the way that Christians have approached things like sex addiction are those that I think actually provide the data, the research that this is what's happening with our bodies. Um, and so it, that's, it, it, I hope that that's not always going to be the case, but I think yeah. that that's part of what the church is waking up to is that we haven't been a light on the hill with regard to mm -hmm. like people coming into our church because they can learn about their bodies and God's design and get the education that they need. Uh, sometimes people have to go outside of the church to be able to get the education that I think could have been provided by the family system, by the church. Uh, so that's a lot of like what it comes down to is kind of yeah. early education of like learning about our bodies. And I think we have the tradition to be able to say, you know, like first Corinthians six, your body is for the Lord, but far yeah, more, that's right. the Lord is also for your body. And that's amazing yeah. that God is for our bodies and is going to lead through these changes. So I think, you know, as Christians, I don't think it has to be that way, but I think we can be a people that, you know, whether it's for our particular city or town or church, for your church to host a sex educator to come in to say, here's the things that like you as parents need to know with regard to your kids. And I'm going to field questions, but I want to make you the search engine for your kid. And what do you need to know? And yeah, there's going to be some awkwardness and some difficulties. And so I would love for the church to be more of a place of sexual learning, discipleship, um, but at this point, it's I see it in different pockets and different smaller yeah. communities, but yeah. I don't see it done really well on like a denominational level, at least to my knowledge at this point. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate the honesty, and uh, yeah. you know, it doesn't it doesn't it it doesn't sound hopeless, right? And so there's there of course not. I don't think and it so is. there's 
Right. And so it's, and I love the language that you use. I think the church is, is awakening to, to the, the needs here to be more proactive um, in, in some different sorts of ways. And uh, yeah, and I think there's an increasing number of resources like uh, your book and others that can help churches and help leaders that, that want to uh, lead forward um, in, uh, in different sorts of ways. So mm-hmm. uh, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and like actually, Julie, yeah, Slattery, for, Julie Slattery has a book called Rethinking Sexuality, and she's really looking at, you know, like she would kind of see a lot of my work is what happens on the downstream level. Like, yes, we need to be addressing it. But for Julie, it's like, how do we go upstream to understand how all these problems kind of came to be? And so I think there's, you know, there's some of us as Christians that are addressing the the debris of abuse and porn and brokenness. Yeah. But I think, you know, Julie is one Christian voice that is going upstream to say, you know, why don't we have Christian discipleship around sex? It's yeah. one of the only realms. So she would be a good voice as well. Yeah, that's great. And there are definitely insights in your book that apply further upstream. Like I was really struck mm-hmm. by how you talked about uh, sensuality and and mm-hmm. defining sensuality far more broadly than just sexuality. So that kind of more to the root idea of just engaging our senses. Um, yes. So that was a really impactful part of the book for me. Uh, and I wonder actually if you could share a little bit about that for our <laughs> listeners. I was, I was really struck. You had a story about how you didn't really listen to a lot of music, but then a friend like gave you this really generous gift of great headphones. Oh uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so I just I loved that part and kind of how you reframed because I I think I was okay. used to thinking about sensuality in more of a narrow uh, sort mm-hmm. of overly sexualized sense. And it's like, wait a second, sensuality is is yeah, it's about the beauty of creation that engages all of the great mm-hmm. senses that God gave mm-hmm. us. So mm-hmm. I wonder if you could speak to yeah. that a little bit. For sure. And this is just one of those areas that has been very difficult for me to to grow in, to understand. Like my wife addresses this much more naturally than I do. So just that sense of like, yeah, like how do you find calm? So if we look at like something like Psalm 131, where the psalmist says, my eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with things too great or too wonderful for me, but I have stilled and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. And if I'm honest, when I first got married uh, with all of my porn history, uh, eating, disordered eating, I, I did not know how to calm myself down in healthy ways. So uh, food was a way that I calmed myself down. Porn was a way that I calmed myself down. Sex was a way that, so all that sense of like, there's a lot of entitlement. There's a lot of like, you know, just demand on my wife, demand on my sexual life to kind of soothe myself in that way. Well, so much of my discipleship is I need to learn sensuality of like, how do I listen to music? And that's the example that you were telling is my friend was like, wait, you are in mental health therapy and you have a cheap pair of Apple white headphones. Like, and he bought me, I mean, we were both right out of grad school at that time. And he bought me like a hundred or $150 pair of headphones, which to me was just like, what on earth are like, what a fool. Yeah, so, Why would you spend so exorbitant, that much? Right. Yeah, yeah. For us at that time. And it yeah, really was, right. but he's like, yeah. that's how committed I am to you for you to having really good music. And I'll never forget putting those headphones on. And I think he sent me a playlist as well. And there was a song from like, I think the group was XX or something like that. And I just remember, he- I remembered hearing these notes that I had never heard before. And I just, I started crying uh, as I mm. went through his playlist because it was so stunning and soothing. And that sense of like my ears beginning to hear, but then music and song beginning to calm my body Well, as someone with the history that I just described of family of origin that was fairly disruptive and chaotic from time to time, a lot of disorders in my life, hearing music was one of the first kind of just very sweet experiences of finding non-orgasmic soothing in my life. Mm. And so we need more of that, that if all of creation kind of testifies to the goodness of God, like there should be, we should be teaching people how to cook, 
how to take a hike, how to listen to music in a way that really calms their body down. And a lot of men that I work with, they only know how to pursue sex for self-soothing, not in almost any wow. other realm, maybe alcohol, um, maybe some other areas like that, but just really teaching, equipping all of us to learn how to calm and to soothe. This is such an important life <laughs> lesson that we need to right. develop. And- yeah, and it showcases how the work in this book is so much broader than just unwanted sexual desires and behavior. Um, and really is what, I mean, we the name of our podcast is The Form.Life, and it's about uh, trying to connect with Jesus in a deeper way uh, that it will impact all of our life. So I love kind of seeing those connections. But uh, as we kind of prepare in just a moment to wrap up, um, I really was struck, you know, the book is really kind of broken into thirds. So you kind of have the, the past story and um, how, how did I write that down? Past story to understand how it has formed and shaped us toward particular unwanted sexual desires or behaviors and understanding our present challenges that keep us in a cycle of perpetually returning to those. Uh, And then kind of section three, growing in wisdom and key strategies and competencies to begin the journey out of unwanted sexual desires and behaviors both now and in the future. So uh, those are those are kind of my summary. I find that helpful to like, it's what did I really see in the book yep. here? And each of those sections were really packed with insights and we've kind of hit on a number of them, but was there any, um, any insight from either uh, any of the sections that stands out that we might have missed in our conversation to mm-hmm. this point that mm-hmm. you think might be particularly helpful to the listeners? Yeah, I mean, I think part of what I'm trying to invite people into is like, so we we always usually start with the present crisis. So that could be an eating disorder, that could be porn, that could be marital conflict of some kind. And how do we begin to kind of not just try to eliminate the problem? And that's what we're guilty of a lot of times. We want to get rid of it. We try and pray it away. But I'm just saying, like, can we look at the present problem and then begin to build a bridge from the present to the past so that we can begin to understand part of the war that we are dealing with? And so part of, you know, part two of my book is this question of why do I stay? And so, you know, we got to learn how did I get here? What are the origin stories? But a lot of times people want to end an unhealthy pattern without understanding how that thing actually serves them. And so part two is looking at how is this thing really working for you, even though it's also an unwanted dimension of your life. So Hmm. we look at a theme like deprivation. And so deprivation, I would kind of just invite people to think about like a seesaw and imagine that seesaw is kind of down and on the you know, the the part of the seat that's touching the ground, that's deprivation. And then the part of the seesaw that's up in the air, that would be entitlement. And so what happens for most <laughs> yeah. of us is that we live with a lot of deprivation. We don't feel like our needs are that important. We don't take care of ourselves well. And so then when we actually get the opportunity that, you know, it, we've just we sign off for the night, we finish our work, we finish putting our kids down, whatever that thing might be we move from this place of deprivation and then seesaw into entitlement of like, I deserve this thing. So when I travel, I can, you know, I'm in deprivation mode, or at least when I used to start out traveling, I would be in deprivation mode. Like I'm going to say no to certain foods. I'm going to like, you know, be very disciplined in my life. And then I would get back on the airplane or walk in the lounge And then I would feel really entitled to like candy bars or uh, gin and tonic because I've been working so well all this time. And so that sense of like, that's what a lot of people can do is interplay between deprivation and entitlement. And it doesn't just have to be in porn. It can be in any area of your life. Right, right. And so all of that, just the invitation to say, what if you didn't live with deprivation all the time? And that's why headphones are a very subtle form of defiance against a world of deprivation. And so that's what I try and fill my day with are these kind of simple pleasures that bring delight, that bring a sense of rest and goodness to my body so that I don't feel like I'm living full on deprivation, which then sets up the entitlement. And then after you're entitled to that particular behavior, 
then that sets up the counter balance, which is I need to go back to deprivation because I don't deserve good things because my desires yeah. are selfish. So yep. it's a bad seesaw. It's a bad seesaw. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah. get off the yeah. seesaw. So yes. no, that's really helpful. Um, so thinking here about uh, someone listening and uh, they're, they're compelled and they're even like maybe the spirit of God is working within them. They want to take a next step. And I know this is a, a person that you don't know, maybe I don't even know necessarily. We, every person's story is unique. But what would you recommend for someone, maybe particularly that has been listening, that uh, has unwanted sexual desires and, and brokenness? What is a, a good next step that applies to, to a broad range of listeners as we think about yeah. wrapping our, yeah. our time up? Yeah. So uh, two things come to mind. The first would be... Uh, you know, this, this notion of what does it mean to swim towards our shame? And so I, I tell this story in the book about this guy yeah. by the name of Andy Casagrande. And he's, he's the videographer for the show Shark Week on the Discovery Channel. So Andy gets into great white, gets into the waters with these great white sharks. And the interviewer was like, Andy, what, what in the world do you do when you're in the water with a great white shark? Like, what are you supposed to do? And he says, it's oh, counterintuitive, but you swim right at the shark with the camera. And so he says, what happens mm -hmm. is when the camera lens bonks up against the shark's nose, the shark has this fear response because if you're a great white shark, everything in the entire ocean swims away from you. Swims so away, right? Is, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> So he says, you know, basically the shark can't figure out why is this thing that's supposed to be swimming away from me actually swimming at me? And then the shark has the fear response and then swims away. And then when the shark swims away, Andy says, that's when I make my escape. And he goes on to say, I think one of the best phrases I've ever heard with regard to shame. And he said, when you do not act like prey, they will not treat you like prey. And that wow. would be just one of those big messages for people is like, we've got to mm. address shame because what I'm about to tell you is you've got to turn and face it. You have to be honest before God, but you also need to be honest before your community or a licensed mental health counselor. And I know that what once I say that, the voice of shame is going to come up to say it's better to just kind of remain silent and you, you know, every word that you say can and will be used against you, you can figure this out That's on right. your own. Right. But the reality yeah. is, is like we have to turn and face our shame in these areas. And that is maybe an unwanted behavior, maybe it's past sexual abuse, maybe it's a past area of heartache, but we have to turn and face these things. And the reason why we need other people is that God has designed us that I can't see my face outside of a selfie or a mirror. I don't know myself or my story. It takes a loving community and a trained person sometimes to be able to help you to understand why you're drawn to what you're drawn to or why an area is so difficult. Because on my own, I am going to have a lot of self-contempt uh, and the yeah. reality that community offers and good, you know, licensed, trained therapists is they are able to hold portions of our story that we're not always able to see. And so turn to face your shame, disempower shame, but also get into a community, a network of people that really want to see you flourish and actually are going to be something of the curiosity of God on your behalf with regard to what you find yourself in. Yeah, that's amazing. And just for anyone listening, uh, Christ community, our church would want to be a place uh, that was safe for anyone to take that type of a step. Uh, and we did certainly don't have all the answers. Uh, and and but we're we're humble listeners and uh, can pursue God together in the midst of that. And and hopefully, as uh, as Jay said, could could hold a bit of that uh, with you along the way. So that we would want that. And so anyone listening, uh, take a next step towards one of your pastors, uh, community group leader, even. Uh, we'd love to to be a church that is uh, trying to write a, a different story in a different way forward. So, uh, Jay and Paul, yeah, let me say, on that? can I yeah. say one one other thing there? So, please do. Like, yeah, and I please. think what you just described is beautiful, and I think that's why I'm so thrilled to be on this podcast with your church is to be able to say like it it, it has to be individuals 
turning to face their shame and reaching out. But it also has to be churches that are not saying this is this. We have a group for that on Tuesdays in the basement of a church. If you happen to be struggling, and that's the discipleship model of like it shouldn't. You shouldn't have to wait for a, a like. I'm if there's an unwanted group. I'm thrilled for that. Our journey course group, thrilled for that. But also let yes. faith communities and small groups become a place that your sexual story is part of your discipleship. Because unwittingly, if we're not talking about our sexual story, we're going to consign these to like church basement meetings, which are yeah, right. inevitably going to elevate shame. So Yes to the individual turning to face their shame, but also yes to the community saying, this is a place of discipleship and we're going to see sexual problems in our sexual life as a primary place of spiritual formation. And if you have those two dynamics where you have individuals turning to face shame and a church deeply committed to bringing education, growth, and healing— um, that is a very rare and powerful community. Wow. Well, that we're trying to be that. And uh, yeah. I know we've got a long way to go, um, but that's really encouraging. So thank you for, for sharing that bit. Um, our final question uh, is one of our favorites here. We ask all of our, our guests and it uh, is a totally, uh, it's a lane shift, but, uh, but we love it. <laughs> and it's really a simple question. Uh, if you could do anything other than the amazing work that you're already doing uh, and gifted <laughs> for and, and doing such great things, but if you could do anything else, uh, kind of what would that be? So I love being a pastor, but uh, I would either be in sports broadcasting or I would design escape oh, yeah. rooms. Uh, if I uh, if yeah. I could answer answer my own question, so what would that I be? I want to hear kind more what... about the escape world that you <laughs> yeah, would build. I love I love escape rooms, uh, so I'd design okay. them if I if I could. So, but what about you? What uh, other than the great work you're huh. already doing? Sort of what would you love to put your hand to if you could? Yeah, uh, two professions come to mind. One is, you know, I mentioned my dad, Presbyterian minister. So I kind of come from that frozen, chosen, Swedish, yeah. Nordic, like just like reserved emotionally. So there's something about like being being more of a, a singer, songwriter, actor, like just more expression that I can, I can mm. feel my, the edges of me want to flirt and drift towards. But there's also uh, my... A few of my uncles on my mom's side were like elite special forces guys, uh, you know, would be part of Delta teams and different organizations in the world that were doing very uh, uh, clandestine things. <laughs> sure. And so yeah. whenever certain things would be declassified and I would hear their stories, uh, I was just so enthralled by the life that they did, that they were up to, that there are so many things that they did in the world that I will never know. And on yes. some read, that's part of what I get to do as a therapist when I work with individuals in this space is like I'm going into realms of darkness and kind mm. of existing in places that um, – very few people will ever know about, but there's something like being very well trained within this and having good skills and techniques. So I think of myself as doing kind of similar, like special forces level yeah. work with individuals, but I want the real deal. If I'm honest, <laughs> yeah, sorry, like, that's, I, I wanna, right. that's right. Yeah. So, oh, but man. like much more unto redemption. Like I'm not that thrilled yeah. by the military yeah. in general. Yeah. Like in terms of just power and not like yes to bringing freedom and goodness to people. But far more like I want to get into realms of darkness uh, yeah. and and work for light in those situations. So. Amen. That's an awesome place to end. Yeah. So thank you so much, Jay. We really appreciate the time. And uh, yeah, we'll have the uh, link to the book uh, in the show notes. And uh, as well, I know uh, Jay mentioned at least a resource or two. We'll have that in the show notes as well. And uh, really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing everybody again uh, next time as we're able to, to gather to have a podcast. So thanks again, Jay. Thank you, Paul. Oh, so good to be with you. Yeah. God bless.